Hi, my name is Greg McLawson. I'm the managing attorney at Sound Immigration. We're a nationwide immigration law firm that serves clients all across the world, and we focus a lot on helping families achieve residency in the United States. So today we're going to be talking about the forms and documents that typically go into a marriage-based adjustment of status case, also called a green card application. Now before we get started, people focus a lot on thinking about the forms and supporting documents that go into these packets. And it's definitely very important to get that right. One thing that's equally important, probably more important, is ensuring before you ever file the application that you're eligible to do so. Why? Because if the application is denied, you risk not just losing that application and the filing fee, but you can potentially be placed into deportation proceedings if it's a process that you shouldn't have pursued in the first place. So whether you talk to an attorney or just do your research yourself, I just want to emphasize that you need to be careful before you ever get started with the process, not just with the process itself. Please understand also that the information provided in this video does not constitute legal advice and you do not have an attorney-client relationship with our firm. Okay, let's start by talking about the required forms that go into an adjustment of status packet. And as you'll see, there are quite a few of them. Now right off the bat, Understand that these forms are freely available from USCIS, that's U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Once in a while, we'll come across a client who paid some online, probably scam, basically, for the forms. But all of these are freely downloadable, and you really should, before you get started with any of these, go to USCIS.gov forward slash forms and make sure you have the most recent edition. If you've picked up a paper copy somewhere, hop online and make sure that it's current. All of these forms are revised frequently and you wanna make sure you have the most current version or else it can be rejected. The first form that goes with an adjustment of status application is the I-130 Petition for Alien Relative. And I think about this as the invitation from the US citizen or permanent resident spouse. We also call that the petitioner. Basically, this is the U.S. petitioner telling the U.S. government that they want to demonstrate that they have a qualifying relative who is going to be going through the immigration process. Again, this is basically the invitation from the U.S. petitioner. Both the U.S. petitioner and the foreign national will file a form G-325A biographic information form. This basically has simple biographic background information about both individuals, previous names they've used, birthplaces of their parents, and residential and work history. Sometimes it can take a fair amount of digging to pull up these address histories. So occasionally this is one of the forms that takes a little while for our clients to get the information together. The I-485 is in a sense the main form used in the adjustment of status process. The I-485 is filed by the foreign national. This is the person who's applying for the green card. The way that I think about it is basically the I-130 is the invitation from the U.S. petitioner. The I-485 basically says, thank you very much for that invitation, U.S. petitioner. Now I would like to take that invitation and turn it into a green card or lawful permanent resident status. The I-864 is probably the form that trips people up the most in the adjustment of status process. This is a form filed by the U.S. citizen petitioner, and it promises to provide a specified level of financial support, if necessary, to the foreign national. Very importantly to understand, this is a binding legal contract between the U.S. citizen petitioner and the United States government. It can be enforced by the foreign national. That's the person applying for the green card. So before you file this, it's extremely important to get clear about the scope of your obligations. If you visit our website, soundimmigration.com, and go to the Form I-864 page, you'll find detailed um, instructions and information about this form. At least one period of time, up to 80% of these forms were getting rejected by the Department of State. Now, the Department of State is different from the entity that adjudicates adjustment of status applications. But just pointing out here that 
a fairly high number of these forms result in errors that require the person to refile the form. So please review the instructions very, very carefully before you file this. The I-765 is not a required part of the adjustment of status packet, but it's free to file it if you do so at the same time as the rest of the forms we're talking about here. Why would you file this? The I-765 is an application for temporary employment. Now, once the individual achieves lawful permanent resident status, that carries with it the uh, legal ability to work in the U.S. The thing is that the adjustment of status process can easily take six or eight months, sometimes even more, depending on what your local office timelines look like. The good thing about the I-765 is it gets the foreign national legal work authorization before she's going to be eligible for lawful permanent resident status. These are supposed to be granted in 90 days. Right now, USCIS is taking longer than that, about 120 days. But either way, this will provide the person a means to work in all likelihood before the adjustment of status application is granted. Another form that's not required, but should always be filed with the adjustment of status packet is the form I-131. This is very important because once you file the I-485 application, you cannot leave the United States until a decision is made. If you do, the I-485 is considered abandoned, which means it will not be adjudicated and you cannot achieve residency based on the application. So if you think you're going to need to travel abroad, or even if you don't think you will, you should file the I-131. The result of this form, once it's granted, is temporary travel authorization. It's called advanced parole, and it, it allows the applicant to tra travel abroad for temporary purposes while the adjustment of status process is being adjudicated. The I-131 and the I-765 are going to both result in a single card called a combo card that authorizes both temporary work and foreign travel. So we've had a look at the forms that go into an adjustment of status packet. Now let's talk about the supporting documents that you're going to want to file along with it. First of all, the filing fees. The government wants its money. The application fee for the I-485 is pretty expensive. It's $1,070, and that includes a biometric fee. For the I-130, it's $420. Now it's important to file these as separate checks money orders or cashier's checks. You can use any of those forms. But you don't want to combine this into a single payment. We've observed over the years that occasionally the USCIS mailroom will reject a packet if these forms are put together. So be on the safe side and put them separately. Regardless of which payment instrument you use, it should be made payable to the US Department of Homeland Security. These are the documents that need to be filed by the U.S. citizen or permanent resident petitioner. First, the individual needs one passport-style photograph that's two inches square. And you can go to any drugstore to get these. Um, we've never had one rejected that was provided by a commercial outlet of that sort. You can theoretically produce them yourselves. I would strongly discourage that because these are very inexpensive to purchase. And we've certainly seen people do terrible things when they try to produce these themselves. If the petitioner is a U.S. citizen versus a resident, the individual needs to provide either his or her passport or birth certificate. If the individual was a naturalized citizen, you need to provide a copy of your naturalization certificate. And also, if the person was born abroad, you provide a copy of what's called a CRIBA, or Consular Report of Birth Abroad. That's relatively rare. For most people, it's going to be the passport or U.S. birth certificate. For a petitioner who is a lawful permanent resident or green card holder, he or she has to provide a copy of both the front and the back of her current I-551 or green card. If the petitioner has been previously married, you'll want to provide copies of both the marriage certificates and also demonstration of how the prior marriage or marriages ended. That means in almost all circumstances, either a divorce decree or a death certificate for the former spouse or spouses. Recall that one of the documents, or what, rather one of the forms we had to file, 
is the I-864 financial support document. In support of that, you're going to want to provide the past three years of tax transcripts. Basically, that's the filing history of your IRS federal tax returns. Strictly speaking, only the most uh, recent year is required, but a best practice is to go ahead and file all three. They're freely available at this web address, irs.gov forward slash individuals forward slash get transcripts. You uh, do not have to pay a fee to request your transcripts from the IRS. You are technically allowed to provide copies of your former tax returns rather than a transcript, but a transcript is the best practice. It's the definitive history of your tax filings. There's really no reason not to just go ahead and get your hands on that because it's free. Now, I have this final category here because, again, the I-864 can be tricky. If the petitioner does not meet the requirement of the I-864, which is that his or her income must be at or above 125% of the federal poverty guideline, then he may have to use other means to demonstrate financial sufficiency. That can include showing liquid assets of his required nature. This is all more complex than we can go into here, but we have very detailed instructions on our website. There is a free downloadable guide that you can take a look at, soundimmigration.com forward slash I-864 dash affidavit dash of dash support. Download that and please take a detailed look at it before you continue on with the I-864. Let's talk about the documents that are filed by the foreign national. Like the U.S. petitioner, she's going to file passport-style photographs, just like you can get at a drugstore, except that because she has multiple applications that she's filing, you file a total of seven of these passport-style photographs. The foreign national provides a copy of her birth certificate, and it used to be required that she file an entire copy of every single page of her passport, but under current standards, it's okay just to do the biographical page. That's the page with her photograph in the passport, and you'll also want to include a copy of the visa page. Now, the F, excuse me, the adjustment instructions are not very clear on this, but one of the things that you have to demonstrate for adjustment of status is that the person entered the United States with inspection. To do that, in most circumstances, you're going to want to provide a copy of the I-94, which is the official arrival record issued by Customs and Border Protection. In um, almost all port of entries in the United States, this is now done electronically. It used to be stapled into your passport. But now you go to this web address that I've listed here, and you can download the I-94, the official version, online. Sometimes it happens that CBP loses track of your I-94 or there's incorrect information, and you'll see that there are instructions on that web page about how to file a complaint and get a corrected version if that's the case. If the individual has any criminal history anywhere in the world, she's going to have to, to provide certified copies of those criminal history documents. But if there's a criminal history, you really need to stop here. Criminal history issues are extremely, extremely complex in immigration law, and you really want to talk to your attorney. Don't assume that just because you consider the prior criminal conduct to be minor, that it doesn't have serious consequences. Um, you really can't make that assumption without having somebody look at it who really knows what they're doing. Next, you'll want to provide an unopened official medical report. This needs to be conducted by a qualified civil surgeon. That's the term that USCIS uses for doctors who are certified to provide immigration medical exams. You can follow this web address here to find a certified doctor. There are these doctors in almost every city in the United States. The cost of these medical exams does vary a little bit, and also the quality of the doctor performing the exam. So don't feel shy about shopping around and asking for price points and availability because you'll see some variance in that. Finally, just like the U.S. petitioner, the foreign national needs to present proof of any prior marriages that the marriage was entered into and then ended in either divorce or death of that for former spouse. Now we're getting into the part that people tend to focus on with marriage-based adjustment of status applications. And that's proving that the relationship is legitimate. Obviously, to start with, you need a copy of your marriage certificate. 
Now be careful with this because in most jurisdictions in the United States, when you get married, you'll be given an unofficial ceremonial marriage certificate, and then later you get the official copy. The informal one does not suffice, so make sure that what you have is the authentic official marriage certificate. For folks who have joint assets together, this can be some of the most important demonstration of a bona fide relationship. If you have any joint banking accounts together, we like to provide at least a six month account history of that. You can block off your account numbers on the statements, but we wanna see both names on the statements and that they've been actually used. So merely having a bank account together isn't necessarily so helpful, but what we really want to see is that there's been money in the account and actually used for joint marital expenses. Likewise, it's helpful if you've had joint credit cards that you've been using together. These should be um, accounts that can be accessed by either couple, and again, that are actually being used, not just an account that was opened and never used for anything. If you're living together at a rental, you'll definitely want to have either a joint lease with both of your names on it, or at the very least, you'll want to have the lease amended to demonstrate that the foreign national is an authorized user of the um, of the rental property. So a lot of times there'll be a place on the lease agreement where authorized um, less uh, authorized residents can be listed. If you have joint auto insurance or registration, this shows both that the couple is living at the same location and also shows at least some joint financial obligation with respect to the auto insurance. If the couple's living together, you also want to provide spouse IDs for the U.S. petitioner to show that the individual is actually residing at the house. Likewise, if the foreign national has driver's license or other IDs showing residency at that address, go ahead and provide those as well. Now, if you had a wedding with friends and family present, as opposed to a very informal courthouse wedding, it's great if you can provide a sample of an announcements that were made, so your wedding announcements. And at USCIS interviews, it's very, very common to get asked about who was present at your wedding. If you can document this in advance with a wedding list, an official registry showing who was present at your wedding, that's even better. Go ahead and provide that in advance. Something I get asked about for every single adjustment of status application we put together is what about photographs? Now for this, the number one thing to think about is quality over quantity. If you went out and had a wonderful meal at Applebee's and you've got 300 pictures of that one night, it's really not all that helpful. What we want to see ideally is a variety of photographs showing the couple over time and in different places. That shows the most um, helpful information to USCIS. Now, sometimes you'll have a situation where the couple was in the same place. Let's say it's the Eiffel Tower. You've got a picture of the husband in front of the tower and then a picture of the wife, but not both together. And that's fine. What we want is evidence that puts the couple in the same place at the same time doing something as a couple. That's what's important. Sworn affidavits are the final thing that has to go into an adjustment of status application to demonstrate the quality of the relationship. This is by any friend or family member who's familiar with your relationship. Now again, the emphasis here is on quality over quantity. We typically want at least two of these affidavits, but I would much rather have two high quality affidavits from people who know the couple very well, rather than 12 affidavits from kind of peripheral friends. What you really want is an affidavit by somebody who's familiar with you as a couple and can explain in their own words what it is about their observations of you as a couple that makes them think that you're in a genuine committed relationship. That's the real question. On our website, we'll provide some downloadable instructions that you can share with your affidavit writers. So that's the basics of what goes into an adjustment of status packet. If you have any questions, you're welcome to contact us. Our website is soundimmigration.com, and you'll see right on the top navigation bar, there's a way to submit a question. 
There's no cost for ants asking a general purpose question. You can also connect with us on Facebook and submit a question there. If you decide that you'd like help with the application process, we'd be happy to talk to you. Again, we work with couples all across the country and all around the world.